Yeah. 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 Yeah, actually, could you sit over on this side? Yeah, it'll be easier for people to see you. Good morning, everyone. I think um, I think that we should go ahead and get started. We have a really uh, a really great panel, and we only have an hour, so I want to go ahead and get things started and make sure that there's time for uh, questions and discussion afterward. Um, so this is this panel is the distributed denial of democracy threats to democratic processes online. This is organized by the National Democratic Institute, the Center for International Media Assistance, and the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, and the way that this panel is going to work is I'm going to uh, open it up with a, a brief statement. I'm going to introduce our six panelists. Each of them are going to have uh, five minutes to uh, discuss the issue that they, they're here to talk about from their region. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions and answers from the audience here and also from the audience online. And um, my name is Daniel O'Malley, and I'm from the Center for International Media Assistance. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. The distributed denial of democ democracy refers to the online use of multiple actors or channels to deny citizens access to or to interrupt the flow of legitimate political discourse, thereby undermining democratic culture and practice. Thus, while a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS attack, takes down a specific website, a distributed denial of democracy attack attempts to, to remove certain voices from what appears to be an open and participatory dialogue. As the prevalence of internet-based media platforms has grown, so has online activity by actors and individuals that seek to silence or exclude voices online. Anti-democratic actors have created innovative new techniques that turn the attributes of the internet against open institutions, harnessing hyper-partisanship, filter bubbles, and age-old human biases accelerated with content stolen by criminals or outright disinformation to erode trust in institutions and increase social strife. These efforts, which are often coordinated and well-resourced, are frequently harder to detect and have the overall effect of undermining civic engagement. The challenges to democracy online are not the product of governments alone. For example, at the Center for International Media Assistance, where I work, 
we have noted how social media platforms are undermining the business model that supports independent media and the circulation of high quality news and information. This weakens the broader me media ecosystem and also undermines democracy, which, which depends on a robust free press. In a similar fashion, online violence against politically active women is much more distributed and has the ultimate effect of silencing voices of women and discouraging their participation in public dialogue. We need to find ways to make sure that the internet fulfills its initial promise of connecting people and enabling them to become more active participants in the democratic process. Ensuring that the future of the internet empowers universal human rights and democratic values will require cooperation from government policymakers, the private sector, and civil society. This is why it is so important for us to discuss democracy and the internet at places like the IGF that are multi-stakeholder. Um, and I would now like to, to briefly introduce this panel, which offers a variety of different perspectives from the private sector, from media, civil society activists, among others. Um, and I'm really looking forward to their comments on the faces that, we, that they're seeing to democratic processes online and the ways that we need to work together to make sure that every region, every sector uh, is, is heard in these debates. So I'm gonna start. Uh, to my right is Hanan Bujemi. She is a senior tech policy expert with more than a decade of experience in the economic and legal aspects of internet policy and governance. And she is also the co-chair of the IGF's Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles. And she's originally from Morocco, but she's now living in the UK. Next to her is Mishi Chaudhuri. She's the legal director of the Software Freedom Law Center based in New Delhi. She consults with and advises businesses in the US, Europe, India, China, and Korea. She's a member of the Bar Council of Delhi, licensed to appear before the Supreme Court in India, all the state high courts in India, and also in the state of New York. And next to her is Jahan Ara, who is the president of PASHA, the Pakistan Software Houses Association, which is the representative trade body for IT and information technology enabled services businesses in Pakistan. She is an entrepreneur and social activist and a strong propagator of extending the power and use of information and communication technologies beyond pure traditional businesses to empower and enable communities. Next to her is Marta Roldos. She's an Ecuadorian journalist and anti-corruption activist. She has been deputy of the National Congress and she was also a member of the Ecuadorian Constituent Assembly. And she is currently the executive director of Fundacion Mil Hojas, uh, which is an organization committed to defending democracy and human rights in Ecuador. And next to Marta is Chris Doten, who is the chief innovation officer at the National Democratic Institute. Chris has designed and implemented programs in dozens of countries which apply integrated, context-appropriate technology to reach more citizens, track political processes, and improve organizing capabilities. And last but not least is Matt Chesson, who is a diplomat and technologist who has served in some of the most challenging assignments in the US Foreign Service. Matt has also led implementation of an open source crowd working platform called Open Opportunities and his uh, particular expertise here that he's gonna be sharing with us is how artificial intelligence enhances computational propaganda. So now I'm going to uh, ask the speakers uh, to uh, give five minute interventions and we're going to start with Marta. Hi, I, uh, sorry. I would talk to you briefly about the experience in Ecuador. In Ecuador for us, internet was like the last frontier. We had an authoritarian regime. We had a GOG law and a communication law that was a censorship law. And then uh, most of the investigative journalism moved to the internet in order to be able to uh, keep publishing, investigating, and publishing. The problem is that the uh, repression moved to the internet too by the government. Since we, were, we are not China, and uh, where government didn't have the capacity to put up great wall and they didn't want that too uh, because they didn't want to be labeled as a, um, as a dictatorship. So they did things more intelligently 
And they devise, uh, we got all the sort of things that, that, that now we are seeing around the world. We got troll centers, Putin style troll centers. We got bots. We got a lot of attacks against women journalists, journalists in general, but women journalists in particular. We got uh, also a lot of propaganda. In, in the case of Ecuador, it was curious because the fake news came from the government, not from the civil society. And the government used all these devices to uh, spread fake news. But we also are like a, a very successful experience of overcoming these, uh, these, these, these attempts of the government. Like in 2011, 2012, it was uh, people got afraid to talk on the on the on the social media, and then we got a lot of uh, participants, mainly investigative journalists, investigative journalist platforms, uh, the lawyers' association. People got into the media. Important players got into the media to counteract the discourse. So when you have. Uh, uh, you, you maybe you teach the people, you teach the public to discriminate against contents. And then you have a very, uh, very normal pe person asking someone who, put, who was putting content on the social media, uh, what is your, f your source? Please put your source, or are you sure about that? And then you have people that have learned in these years to discriminate uh, this kind of content. So they try to uh, keep disinformation campaigns, but now people know better. Maybe you can do it by a, for a day, but like a, the next day, the disinformation is uh, contested but infor be, by informant people. But that is because, you know, mainly players got into the social media. You have MPs in social media, you have lawyers in social media, you have a lot of human rights activists, feminists, all in social media. And we began to counteract also the attacks, mainly, uh, namely, uh, the, the, a teacher, a woman teacher who was uh, head of the teachers union, the photograph the new, her new photograph, nude photograph, were posted by people related to these government troll centers to defamate her. But all the women, like five minutes after that, all the feminists, not only feminists, journalists, all people was pouring support towards her and were condemning what they were doing. So it was uh, very effective. Now we are in a kind of transition in Ecuador. We were able to uh, still to, to keep publishing uh, cor the news about corruption. We were able to push uh, a human rights agenda because m all the main players got into the social media too. So that's Ecuadorian experience. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Marta. <clears throat> and uh, I think we'll, we'll now turn to Jihan, who can tell us about some of the experiences that they're having in, in Pakistan. Thank you. Um, so in Pakistan, since I represent the private sector, I would like to first own up to the fact that until about nine, ten years ago, the uh, IT sector in Pakistan was very insular. Uh, we only engaged with government on policy uh, in a very civilized fashion. You know, we would write to them or we would hold meetings with them. We wouldn't be very aggressive. We thought that was the work of activists. And um, until the, in 2007, when the government tried to push through the cybercrime bill, it's when we woke up. And we realized that uh, we would have to do something. And I think one of the smartest things we did was uh, we used the multi-stakeholder approach and we connected with activists, with media organizations, and with all stakeholders whom we knew were involved in policy making. So that way, 
you know, we got together, we had meetings, we shared what our concerns were, and we approached the government and lawmakers uh, with one voice. So that made us a lot stronger. And that group over the years has become stronger and has engaged with parliamentarians, with all stakeholders together. And I think that makes it a very powerful group. And that's how democracy is supposed to function in any case. So some of the things that have been happening um, as far as Pakistan is concerned is, other than the cybercrime bill, which we continue to be engaged in with government, they have uh, finally made it into an act. And there are still some areas of concern, although having engaged with them, we have had, uh, we've been able to push through some of our concerns and it is not as draconian as it was when they first drafted it. But, you know, multiple takedowns of, um, you know, platforms, uh, mobile services being shut down under the guise of security, uh, those kind of things continue to happen. And that affects communication. It also affects essential services, like emergency services. When you can't work on your mobile, you, your, your number is inoperative, you cannot contact emergency services, you can't contact services like Uber, and multiple services now that citizens, uh, business people all depend on on a regular basis. Uh, so, so those are things that we continue to engage with government on. And I think that's something that we will have to uh, make sure that they understand. I think one of the things that I have seen um, myself is that there are always champions within parliamentary groups and policymakers whom if you engage with them and educate them, because sometimes it is ignorance that uh, results in some of the worst policies that come through. If you engage with them, educate them, then they become your champions. And we've held uh, press conferences uh, with activists, with uh, politicians and media to make sure that the message gets across, that people understand what it is we're fighting and that it's not all a lot of noise. Um, activists, of course, have, uh, whether it's activists who, have, who are younger, who have now engaged on social media, or whether it is women activists especially who've been engaging with government for the last 30 years. They don't, they're not that powerful as far as social media, internet, and all that is concerned, but the younger people are now engaging with them and making sure their voices are also heard on the internet. Uh, these, many of these women um, do not want to um, be openly visible on social media or on the internet simply because uh, they feel threatened. So, you know, it is our responsibility as technologists as well as the activists amongst us who can teach them how to keep themselves safe and secure on the internet. So we're all, we've all been working together and I think that's resulted in a very powerful stance that we've been able to take. Of course, the challenges continue and we will have to continue to uh, make sure that any policies that are made or any threats to privacy uh, there's no data protection law. Uh, platforms who sometimes tend to be very compliant with the government simply because they want to continue to make money. Uh, also, telecom providers uh, whose licenses depend on the government, um, sharing of our data with anybody and everybody, those kind of things are, are things that concern us. But I'm just grateful that the private sector, the IT sector has woken up and is now actually actively engaged, many of uh, the IT business people are now more activists than <laughs> you would, uh, you know, that you would even, uh, you know, you would expect from people who were otherwise in suits and, and you, you know, only engaged with government in a very professional manner. So um, this is something that's happening in Pakistan and that's what I wanted to share. Great, thank you. And I, I think that's a really powerful story of uh, kind of, different sectors working together, as you said, you know, when you, once you spoke in a united voice, people listened and that you were able to find champions in government, which is really important in, in these cases. Um, I'm gonna now turn to Mishi, um, who's going to talk a little bit about what uh, problems that uh, she's been working on and, and seeing in, in India. Um, thank you. Just for clarification, I'm the legal director of Software Freedom Law Center based out of New York. Um, I am the president and uh, founding director of SFLC.io. Um, I'm going to be talking only about my work in India. Um, I, I think um, 
I usually find that problems um, now, um, no matter which jurisdiction you are talking about, there per uh, perhaps is a common thread which runs through. So I could just shut up and say, you already heard it and you will hear it. Um, but I'm gonna just concentrate on a little bit of a uh, different sliver here um, in, in the same light. I think it's true that the political parties have figured out what is the power of internet to shape the discourse. I also think that primetime television takes its cues nowadays from what's going on in social media and therefore uh, the entire discussion about what is important and what should be highlighted has now become a part of the cacophony which the internet feeds into. Um, the topic itself, the distributed denial of democracy, I think the problem is itself may be too large for the solution because it's not just the net that's at fault, but I think we as human race as well because we are the people who actually make the internet. Um, we all started and we wanted freedom of every brain to learn, but we also have a lot of intermediate objectives and then we get distracted. We have intermediate objectives of winning elections to making more money and uh, various other things. Uh, the, the power of the net for shaping politics or misshaping of politics, um, I think the government are finding it very hard to have a consistent focus on the human effect on the net as much as they've already figured out the political or the economic effect of it. Where I come from right now, um, shutdowns, which is the complete blanket shutdowns of the network connection, is the all or nothing response of the states to the problems they think cannot be solved. Shutdowns, of course, induce censorship, they increase despotism, but they don't actually solve the problem of this internet, which is now we, something which we have created. It's a, it's a blundered ruster. It suits the state power sometimes, but in no regard help what the society actually needs. It does provide people with an experience of the limitation of distraction, which is good for like maybe 10 minutes again. Uh, my work uh, and my organization's work is a cat cataloged on something <coughs> called the Internet Shutdowns Tracker. You can find it on internetshutdowns.in. It shows that in India, the shutting down of the net is the constant locating problem, and it's a system. It's broken over here, it's broken over there, it's always broken in Kashmir. It's really an example of the way in which the government has yet to figure out how it can help the society deal with the net. All about It's mostly about aggression and hostility, which is what the government's ex usual explanation is. It's about rumor control. It's about avoidance of communal violence, national security. It's never about how do we use government's authority to help create a better environment. Just, um, uh, it's definitely the crudest form of harm limitation from their end. Uh, just in terms of numbers, we've had 65 internet shutdowns in India in 2017 alone. 25 times it was killed in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. For three months from June 18 to September 18, Darjeeling, which is um, a, pro uh, a place in uh, East India. Um, it was completely covered in darkness. Um, our shutdown tracker also goes <coughs> and tracks about um, um, the whether it was mobile uh, shutdown or was the fixed line internet shutdown. Um, most developing countries, the access to internet comes through mobile network. 94.3% of Indians who are online connect to mobile and not fixed line internet. So once the mobile network goes down, that means their connection to internet is totally snipped. Um, we track stories also because all those statistics are important, but after all then they become just numbers and personal stories do tell you what's really going on. Um, people are not able to pay their loans, um, their monthly installments. Students are not able to apply to universities because now it's only one place and if they have to apply to universities which are not in the same part as they live in, then if there's no internet and no fixed line or mobile internet, it's difficult for them to run their regular life. And if it's not there for three months like in Darjeeling, then you can only imagine that after high school if something which is an equivalent of an SAT and you're not able to take it because there's just no network connection, 
how does it impact your future in comparison to the rest of the country which is actually applying. We also got certain stories. All of these are cataloged on our website. Uh, but um, where surgeons said that uh, there's now a move to move <coughs> everything online. And a lot of times they're not able to access their own patient's data before they can go and continue with some kind of surgeries which are scheduled. So it's real, um, it's small businesses now rely on communication services such as WhatsApp. People run, take their orders, deliver their orders using these services. And once they have no access to it, these are people who do not have a lot of capital which, is going, which they can rely on when there is no network connection. Um, we do appreciate having worked with the government to understand that the policeman's job is maintenance of public law and order on the ground. And if they're doing it right, they're doing it without much collateral damage. That's what one at least expects usually. Generally speaking, the net shutdown um, imposes a fair amount of collateral damage. That's the conclusion we have come up with. And the policeman's tool in this case are extremely limited. And the fact that they have this one, it means it's going to be grotesquely overused. Not because that there is any justification for this, but it's like, well, to every hammer, every problem is a nail. And if you only have one hammer, so you shut down the net for whatever good it will bring to you. I also particularly think that the comprehensive surveillance which now exists in order to enable advertising has become the political economy of the net. So much so that now it's worth for platform companies to be able to carry people's packets at their own expense in return for the light of a right of being able to look into what people are talking. Um, various examples. Um, in um, uh, Free Basics by Facebook still exists in many other countries. And how this works in view of democracy is not only now a developing country problem, and we are watching it play out in different parts of the world where suddenly it has caught everybody's attention. Um, I also think that there's an overbalancing in this direction because when there are political troll armies, of one political party trying to drown the discourse, then the, then the promise of the net that it's going to democratize uh, discussion and everybody will have a chance to talk takes a very different color of its own. And um, when women and uh, when other particular groups which are vulnerable groups two, three years ago started raising a problem that we are being really harassed and this is going beyond control, a lot of platforms and a lot of people were said, well, if you don't like it, just get off the platform or develop a thicker skin. But that's only just telling you what is coming. And now we live in that era when there's not just vulnerable people or women who do have opinions because they are equally citizens, sometimes smarter, which can only be my belief. But, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but when they are kept off some kind of discussions, you know uh, that there will be everybody else who will face the same thing. So I think that's where we are in most of the places. Great, thank you, Mishi. And I, I like the, the, the thing that you pointed out there at the end, that these are issues that are, are global and not just in, in specific countries. Sometimes we see some of the issues like the, the free basics um, debate in India in those regions, but these are really global issues that we're all trying to grapple with. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think uh, that's a really important point to highlight. Um, I'm now going to turn to Chris Doten from NDI. Great. Thanks, Dan. Hi, folks. Great to be here. Um, so, uh, at NDI, we work a lot on improving citizen access to political processes, uh, and particularly around elections. Uh, and so we've seen a, a huge level of impact on the, uh, the, the political conversations and discussions that take place at those most sensitive of uh, pivot points in the history of a, of a country, which is an election, uh, where things can really swing dramatically based on um, a sometimes very, very small change in outcome. So, you know, with the, the rise of uh, a lot of these challenges to democracy online, whether it's uh, dis disinformation or trolling or so on, people will often uh, – poo-poo uh, this a little bit, say, well, you know, uh, this is not new, 
uh, Mark Twain talked about how uh, rumors are uh, go all the way around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. Or um, Thomas Jefferson ran a, a, a whole series of net newspapers that did stuff that any of us would define as uh, fake news, scurrilous attacks on uh, John Adams. So uh, that may be true, but something that I, I think that really is new and different is uh, um, in the field of computational propaganda that's using using computers and to accelerate or increase the, the flow of uh, targeted messaging online. Uh, something that I think is new is the problem of, that we refer to as manufactured consensus. So, um, you know, there's a number of things that are, that are true and challenging when it comes to uh, disinformation and political communications online. Um, you know, it turns out that, uh, Mishi re referred a bit to, to human psychology here, um, you know, it turns out that, like, consistency of messaging isn't important. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times you get hit with uh, variants on, on different messages that are, that are false or, or uh, incorrect. Uh, the, uh, that, that will still f uh, serve to undermine a narrative. Um, you know, the, we see a lot of attacks on what had been gatekeepers of truth or um, kind of authorities or uh, elites that had been uh, before sort of people who helped us establish what was correct or what was, uh, what was not. Uh, that whole process is being, being undermined. But um, what we think is, I think in some ways, most disruptive is this, this challenge of um, the tapping into humans herd instincts. We're all like, we're social animals, we're communal animals. And so there's a huge amount of implicit pressure just built into our nature to kind of go along with what seems to be uh, the, the kind of the common opinion of, of everything. Um, and so that's something that can be deeply problematic online uh, thanks to the, the, the problems of bots and, and uh, computational propaganda. If a message is relayed via a whole bunch of different messengers, or what we think are different messengers, and we see that popping up in our, in our news feeds or in our, our Twitter streams or even our messaging apps over and over, then it will appear to us as though that is what everybody thinks. Um, now, that may in fact not be in the least bit true. This is something that we've seen a lot um, in technology with uh, crowdsourcing uh, in general. Anything that, we, that people tend to use volume as a proxy for accuracy or, um, or intent. Um, one of my favorite examples is when there was a, 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 an open survey of where uh, Justin Bieber should do his next concert. Uh, Pyongyang was the, the selection of the masses, not because that's where most of Justin Bieber's fans <laughs> wanted him to go, but enough other people jumped on it. The same sort of thing can be used for much less humorous purposes um, by trying to uh, convince people that uh, something that's completely untrue is the case or that um, they should uh, you know, vote a certain way um, uh, or s refrain from voting at all because everybody is equally corrupt and problematic um, and the whole dem democratic system can be thereby undermined. You know, we see this uh, playing out globally, whether it's uh, things like Peña bots in, uh, in Mexico, the, uh, the extraordinarily uh, effective use of Facebook Messenger in uh, the Philippines with President Duterte, um, and in and many other uh, countries around the uh, developed and developing world, uh, we're seeing this take place. So um, I it's hard to know what the, the answer to some of this is. I think um, Marta mentioned how in Ecuador uh, people have become more informed, more, more uh, uh, intelligent consumers. Uh, and so there is certainly a, uh, an, a literacy question to this. People can be a little bit more aware. Um, it also may be that the, the, the switch to messaging applications may actually help reduce some of these, these threats. When we're not in the kind of the open public spheres of Twitter, Facebook, it may be that some of these uh, smaller conversations that are more typically between people that you actually do know may be less, well, in, less impacted by this. Um, we would certainly advocate for more of a, uh, as when possible, uh, uh, labeling bots uh, online to try and help uh, people distinguish what is legitimate conversation from, uh, from actual organic humans to what is being pushed or propagated. Um, but if, this, if the genie is truly out of the bottle and there's uh, very little that can be done to stem the flow of, um, of computational propaganda via bots, we may be in a weird world where uh, democracy advocates have to start training um, what, who we consider the good guys, uh, uh, pro-democratic uh, uh, forces, on how to use their, build and use their own bots, um, and that we may end up 
in a world where the, the bots are all dueling it out for, for democracy. So uh, leave it at that. Look forward to questions later. <coughs> Great. Thank you, Chris. And Matt, now you're going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, which is kind of like the next level of these, these bot armies that, that Chris was mentioning. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, my work has focused on the intersection of artificial intelligence and computational propaganda and how we combat disinformation online. Um, my government, the United States, is still trying to fully understand this phenomenon. Um, and I want to talk about uh, some of the research that I've done on uh, looking at some of these emerging AI technologies and how they can impact computational propaganda. Um, but first, I just want to put in a word uh, for preserving the freedom of expression and avoiding censorship. Um, so the United States government promotes a vision for the Internet that is interoperable, reliable, secure, and open. And a big part of that openness is this freedom of expression. Um, we believe that people have the same rights online as they do offline. And the Internet's got a tremendous amount of value to us um, from our ability to freely associate with each other, share ideas, express ideas and opinions, and to do that free of uh, interference or censorship. And so we don't want to utilize uh, we don't want to take this problem of disinformation online and, and use it as a reason to censor free speech online. So that being said, let's, um, I, I just want to play on a couple of things that um, uh, Chris had already mentioned here. Um, so what are, what are folks doing with some of these technology tools? Um, doxing and bullying is very common, um, where they'll release personal information about people in an attempt to keep them quiet, and then they use these armies of bots basically to reinforce those messages and those threats against people. Um, they'll do hashtag spamming is another common one. Um, activists are trying to organize via hashtag. They'll just spam that hashtag with a bunch of uh, garbage information so that um, the activists can't actually communicate with each other or organize. Um, most of these techniques um, use, uh, most of these techniques violate platform terms of service, so they're not technically illegal, um, but they do violate uh, Twitter, Facebook, and other social media platforms um, terms of service. Um, and then, you know, what Chris mentioned was this uh, use of networks of fake social media accounts. These are accounts that impersonate real people, um, and then they try and manufacture this consensus. Um, so these are sort of the, the challenges that we're, um, that we're facing and that we're dealing with. Um, but, you know, we, we can't be judging the actual speech that's coming out because that gets us into the realm of determining truth from fiction. What we really need to focus on are the bad actors, the bad intentions, and then the bad effects that they're having uh, on uh, communication online. Um, so now let's talk about some of the art emerging artificial intelligence technologies that are going to impact computational propaganda. And also to be clear on this, the technologies by themselves are not inherently bad. There's nothing inherently bad about these technologies. They, can be, they will be used for a lot of good, um, but they can be used for some of these malicious purposes, and we need to be aware of what these are. Very quickly, um, what is artificial intelligence? Um, we're not talking about sentient computers here. Um, AI is popularly thought of as machines that exhibit intelligence, and that definition's fine. A uh, better definition is to think about it like biology or chemistry. It's a field of problems to solve that deal with pattern recognition, autonomy, perception, recognition, learning, and decision making. Um, so it's, it's a better way to think about it like that. It's a little more inclusive, and it gets us out of this realm of thinking about what Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking talk about. Um, and so um, let's talk about some of these technologies. So chatbots are uh, increasingly able to have human-like conversations. So Microsoft's Xiao Ice is probably the most popular one. Um, it was a Weibo top influencer. Uh, people have proclaimed love for Xiao Ice. Uh, they tell it uh, they wish she was a real girl and they want to marry her. Um, so people develop these very close uh, relationships with these chatbots and they're only gonna get better and better at having conversations that um, basically emulate human beings. Uh, AI systems are getting really good at creating, uh, dynamically creating content, so books and screenplays. They create some really good visual art and some really good music now. Um, what's a little more concerning to me is actually the uh, sort of these audio and video manipulation technologies. You might have seen some of these where you can sort of do this real-time manipulation of real videos online. There's um, one out of Stanford where they manipulate um, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin's um, face in a YouTube video, and then there's some um, that basically dynamically generate speeches that Obama never made. Um, so these, these tools are going to generate all of this content um, and basically create this sort of pliable reality where they're modifying and shaping events in real time and creating fake events. Um, you have affective computing and psychometric profiling. Um, these tools are really good at figuring out what people's emotions are and communicating to them um, in an emotional way and also figuring out what people's personalities are, their sexual orientation, political leanings. You can figure out all of these things with just a very few pieces of data and then use it to um, create personalized propaganda and disinformation. 
These are um, digital tools, so once you create one, it's very easy to then create many more of them. They learn so they can optimize their behavior, and they can be working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So while we're still trying to shape responses to things, they can be out shaping narratives. And so we're moving to this era where we're going to shift from this bot-driven computational propaganda um, that are just pushing out human-generated content to this autonomous computational propaganda that's pushing out this machine-driven content. And that's going to complicate some of these existing problems that we're seeing with computational propaganda. Um, also, just interesting um, sort of cultural note, you know, we're going to see a lot more of these machine-driven accounts communicating with each other and sharing information with each other. And so we're going to have other intelligences moving into the online communication space. And that's a big unknown as to um, how that's going to work and what the impacts of that are going to be on um, human communication online. Um, so I wrote a paper about this, um, and uh, it's called The MadCom Future. It was published with the Atlantic Council if you want to read more about this. I'm a big proponent of artificial intelligence. It's going to be probably one of the most benefi beneficial technologies that uh, mankind's ever produced. Um, but we do need to be aware of this coming wave of machine-driven communication, um, and we want to make sure that we, it doesn't interfere with uh, free expression online. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> and now we're going to, to turn to Hanan, whose expertise uh, at global internet governance forums, um, working on internet rights and principles, is one of the reasons why we, we have her on this panel, because we've just heard a number of different issues from uh, government trolling, surveillance uh, in, in, in Pakistan, the blunt use of um, shutdowns in India, also the... Um, the, uh, the comprehensive surveillance as a uh, business model, computational prop propaganda, bots. W I mean, we've heard about a lot of different things that are all um, going to shape how people engage in the future and how people will participate in democratic processes. Mm -hmm. how, what, what are some of the things that we can do, and, and where might this go in the space of, of Internet governance? Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure I have some magical you know, <laughs> solutions to all this, but we've heard a lot about you know, um, shutdowns, which are the major issue um, in the last maybe two years or three years. Um, there are other, you know, problems, you know, with the with platforms in general. Is the mass production of content that is pushed through different channels. Um, I call them content platforms because I don't want to talk anymore about, you know, social media. So um, uh, we need to understand that phenomenon, you know, at various levels. So it's not only uh, political. Um, I, the, these these contents they literally shape public opinion, and in certain instances uh, they uh, basically change the narrative, and we all do have to worry about that. But how do we solve all this? Um, I mean, I, w I was very um, you know pleased to hear all the stories and all the case studies from 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 um, Pakistan and how the private sector turned to be um, um, an efficient um, actor uh, to to to. Um, to affect, you know, what's happening at the local level and open channels uh, with governments so uh, you can address a little bit of these issues since they are concerned with what's happening. I mean, they are the almost the extended arm of the government. So when shutdowns happen, we need to understand that, you know, operators get sometimes direct orders from, I don't know, from the uh, Ministry of Defense or it depends on, on the country. Um, so how do we solve all this? So our work at the um, uh, coalition is um, specifically concentrating on using what we call soft norms, you know, common, you know, framework that we can define at the global level to address these things. Why? Because we think that regulation is usually slow uh, to adapt to technology um, and also um, hampers in, in many instances democratic values in, in general. So that's why we focus on principles because we thought that we can adopt um, a holistic view of what society needs, what are the core values that we all need to subscribe to in order <laughs> to have um, a de democratic space, whether offline or online. Now, what's happening in technology is worrying beyond the shutdowns. I mean, we do have uh, a lot of decisions now uh, which affects uh, how people are going to connect to the internet. Um, and I think what's happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis the network neutrality discussion in North America in general is considered um, like it's a, it's a turning point actually in, in, in our field. And I think we, um, we were fighting for democratic countries for a long time to be established. I think the next 10 years will be, um, 
you know, probably focusing on how we can democratize the internet, I, I expect this topic to be a top item in the agenda of our discussions here in Policy Fora. So the Internet Rights and Principle Coalition have developed um, a set of uh, principles, 10 principles based on a charter uh, that was uh, conceived a few years back in the context of the IGF. And it was um, a collaborative work which um, included actors from various disciplines, legal, government, private sector, um, activists and civil society in general. Um, the agreement was to uh, design principles that are easy enough to digest uh, uh, for, 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 for the normal public, but uh, it turned out that the principles were actually handy even for governments, so uh, unexpectedly we managed to influence some of the uh, important policy processes in different countries, be it in New Zealand, Italy, um, you know, in different countries which, um, which use the principles as a baseline to um, design their own policies. Uh, I think um, a lot of progressive governments see a point in, in, in establishing a, a common framework uh, of values, core values that we all can uh, base on to, to, to do our work on, on the internet. Uh, so I think um, the work that we've done um, along you know, nine or 10 years now um, uh, has evolved a lot and uh, we're very pleased to see uh, other organizations um, you know, defining the value uh, of our achievements and basing on it so we can move forward because there is a lot happening. 10 years ago there was no shutdowns but now we see uh, you know, the importance of um, stipulating how important it is to preserve these principles for democratic values uh, and that applies to many fields and I think the missing discussion in this forum was about media and I point that out. So we don't have a media practitioner group specialized in highlighting all the issues that comes with, you know, uh, uh, media uh, development or uh, uh, media in general. I think we probably should start a separate track at the IGF so we can look at all uh, the issues uh, uh, specific to, to, to the media sector and uh, how we can link it to what's happening in, in the content um, you know, industry uh, powered by technology and powered by uh, the internet. Um, so there is a lot happening and um, myself, I'm still learning you know, what's going on in the media sector. Um, so I think if we agree to um, maybe combine our work to uh, you know, integrate the set of values we've been working on uh, to encompass other sectors like media, that will be great. Um, and I hope, you know, other countries or other organizations will adopt, you know, these principles and try to promote them. Uh, we, we were contacted by uh, some Russian fellows in this meeting. Somebody sent me an email yesterday to say that, oh, your charter is translated to Russian. And he handed it to me. I, I don't know him, you know, like he just uh, came across our work and they made a commentary as well on certain sections that we need probably to ad adapt to the Russian context because we keep, you know, adding, uh, you know, points to, to the charter. So, uh, I mean, I think it's, we, we think it's great, you know, we, we really appreciate, uh, you know, people um, going through uh, the details of the charter and finding a value in doing it. Uh, so as I said earlier, I think we should focus more on, uh, on probably agreeing on a set of values um, and not rely entirely 100% on, on regulation to, to make things happen because we know how, uh, things can be slow at the legal uh, side. Thank you. Great, thank you, and, <clears throat> and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna open up the floor to questions, so we're gonna take, um, do we have any questions from the online space? No, unfortunately. Okay, so we're gonna take um, three questions from the floor, and then we're going to, to let the, our panel respond to that. So um, if anyone has a question, you know, please raise your hand now. Um, I, I have a quick and short question. First of all, it's been a fantastic panel, and I really liked all the speakers. But I uh, just to the last the last speaker. Uh, oh, my name's Joanna Bryson. I'm a professor of artificial intelligence. Um, but I, and I also work at the Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. So maybe I can work with some of you there. Uh, but uh, I'm at the University of Bath. Okay, long introduction, short <laughs> question. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it, you said uh, that um, I agree with you that regulation can be slow and principles are really useful in getting the soft law out. 
but in your first introduction, you said that regulation can actually be anti-democratic. And I, I think of law as ultimately we do want to uh, you know, capture the good ideas and push it forward. So, um, and also, I think most of the space, most of artificial intelligence does happen already in a regulated space and that what we need to do is improve the regulation because it's, it's not uh, built to purpose as things change. So I always think of regulation as something we, we also need to, as a parallel process, catch up. So why do you say it's actually bad for democracy? Can hold that, hold that thought. We'll take a couple more. Yes, Boris Engelson, a local journalist free laws. And since I have attended only half the session, my question will be at best half sensible. Uh, if you look for Grameen Bank or Mohammed Yunus online, you will get easily hundreds of articles praising microcredit, Grameen Bank, and Mohammed Yunus. If you have any doubts, then it will take half a day or even more to find some documented article analyzing beyond just the slogans, the realities of microcredit. What do I mean by that? I mean that in a world of not information poverty, but information ex excess, um, uh, censorship and manipulation go this way. It is why some uh, cliché are plenty and some truths are hidden. And this mirrors, to a large extent, the own prejudices of the public. One should, and this leads me to the second point, is that in the case of Ecuador, which what makes things all the more difficult is that Ecuador government has a good image with the civil society, rightly or wrongly. They can hide behind the socially progressive, etc., rhetorics. And so it will be very difficult to convince the civil society of some truth because they will feel that they are stabbing their own bodies in the back. Great, thank you. And do we have one more question from the floor and another intervention? Okay, I'll turn it over to Hanan first and then we'll open up uh, the floor to the, the second question, which is a good one. Oh, thank you, Daniel. Okay, so, um, yeah, well, I, I said that's on purpose. You know what, because uh, law is interpreted in different ways according to, you know, the context. Um, and when I mentioned that um, regulation can be slow to adapt and it hampers in certain contexts democratic values. I meant it because I worked a lot in the Middle East and I can assure you that um, implemented legislation specific to the internet um, is not necessarily reflecting you know, the uh, democratic values we believe in, um, as an example, freedom of expression. Um, so that kind of statement is maybe you know, general enough but at the same time specific, because we can see that you know, happening in, in certain contexts. Uh, I know that law means com something completely different in the US, but in other regions, it, it's a completely different story. Great, thank you. And um, now the, the second question about excess of information as a form of uh, manipulation or censorship, uh, the situation in Ecuador, anyone? Uh, I would like to address both uh, both questions, sorry. Sometimes I would like to, to be able to speak Spanish because I, I would do it faster. But uh, the thing is, I think something that, that, that you said uh, a minute ago is that we need to think how to foster good journalism. Because part of the disinformation thing is that you need to foster good journalism. No. You need to be able to uh, find ways to convince people, maybe to raise money like uh, this, 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 pro this um, multi-stakeholder way of raise money for good, good projects of journalism. Because th that, that, that's the question, you know, to do good journalism takes time. I took, it took us, Milojas, six months to investigate how our highways were built, building in Ecuador because it was the main propaganda of our government, you know. Now we have highways. And then we find that some of our highways cost 100, 10, uh, 10 times or to 100 times more than a kilometer in the United 
uh, in in Europe. So when, you, but it took it took to put two persons six months to go through database and misinformation. So it takes time. It it's co it costs. Even if you charge little and you have underpaid journalists, it costs time and it costs a lot of effort. And people both need to value that. And, accord and, and in the Ecuadorian case, gratefully, it's not the case anymore about our government. They are in very, very, the last government, Korea, has a very low popularity. But it was in a high day. And when he was in his heyday, the ones who were pushing for the truth, we were persecuted. I have friends who went to j that went to jail. I have indigenous people, leaders, that went to jail just for protesting. So it's very revolutionary to give your uh, mine, to, your, the jungle to the Chinese mines, co mine companies. And, but I don't know, I think it's Twain that said that you cannot fool everybody all the time. You can fool somebody sometimes, but you cannot fool everybody all the time. But it has a cost because until you kind of you have the possibility of, of fight back, of organize people. And it's very funny because in Ecuador we work like in several platforms at the same time. So I'm, I'm feminist too. So I have a big, huge uh, group of feminist friends and we have a WhatsApp group. And when some of them knew that another friend of us was being attacked, attacked by the government and they were posting her nude photograph on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, they, they, we all organized through WhatsApp to act in Twitter and Facebook. So it's, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of organizing, but it happens. Now in Ecuador, we have had our shutdown, so, but they don't say that they are shut down. They say, you know, the cable broke. <laughs> Where's the inform? Where's the report? No report. So, and when you come from countries like ours, sometimes you are afraid of laws that may be well intentioned they, that can curtail uh, freedom of expression. Because freedom of expression is your last recourse. At least in Ecuador, we said at least we have the derecho de pataleo, the kicking back, that, that crying, that. That's our last resource, our last resource for help. And it helps because when you cry, someone helps. Thank you. So on this uh, concept of uh, sort of this volume of information, I mean, this is one of the tactics that dis, uh, malicious actors use to spread disinformation. Um, and it's not just with bots. They'll actually create, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of web pages um, that look like local NGOs, they look like regional newspapers, they look like experts, but they're actually replicating the same disinformation over and over again. Um, and part of that is to game the algorithms that basically push things up to trending topics or game the Google search engine or things like that. And the platforms are always, you know, it's always a struggle they're trying to work on these things. But what they're actually trying to do is capture people into this ecosystem of disinformation. So they lure people in with uh, emotionally pleasing information and then they capture them in what looks like a rich media environment where they see a lot of web pages replicating the same information and then a lot of social media accounts that are saying the same thing. Um, but those are all being run sort of by the same actors or the same network of disinformation actors. And so, you know, uh, I think Chris mentioned so we might need to use some of the same tools to, to counteract this. Now, we should never use uh, disinformation and we should never use unattributed accounts. That's just going to contribute to the problem. But a lot of the same tools can be used to actually direct streams of truthful information at these vulnerable and targeted populations to make sure that there's no gap that these malicious actors can actually fill. So I think that's something that we all need to think about is how can we actually make sure um, that we use technology in a positive, proactive way to address some of these, um, these malicious actors. Great. Mishi, you, you got something you want to say? Um, uh, there, there are various things I want to say, but <laughs> uh, this particular thing, I'm, um, I'm very interested, and also I think, Chris, you made a point earlier about if we move to messaging apps, perhaps that will do s uh, have some impact. In my work, in different places, what I've watched is um, once organized power figures out how to use certain tools, 
we are basically just catching up and cataloging things. Right now, um, I have watched how preparation for certain kind of elections is done. Um, it's, it's not to the conscious mind, it's to the subconscious mind. And if I can continue to get WhatsApp forwards, which is very common if you see in Latin America and Africa, Southeast Asia, various other places, messages which are tailored to exactly what my issue is, what my in my dialect, and exactly what the messaging should be, is now constantly being used. So, um, and one of the issues when, and there are these are real like when there's a com threat of communal violence and you speak to a policeman on the ground, which I've done because of internet shutdowns, is that they say, you guys want end to end encryption in WhatsApp, but then you don't want, when we have a thousand people, thousands and thousands of people gathering on the ground and they're going to disrupt the public law and order, what do we do? It's a very difficult answer at that time as a person who likes free speech and expression to give. Um, about rule of law, I, I do work in two very different jurisdictions. I think one of the problems internet has done is that everybody believes people have the First Amendment right of the U.S. Constitution. Most constitutions don't give us First Amendment rights. It's a free speech and expression with restrictions creeping in in various other ways. So I, I would urge everybody, because this happens to me as a lawyer all the time for the last several years, that you don't have the U.S. First Amendment. You have a different limit. All your laws will go and face that limit, and that's how it would become. And um, it, the interesting thing Anand was saying that rule of law means different things in different jurisdictions is it can be unpacked in a lot of ways. One idea I just want to put out is it's very um, it's very unpopular. Let me say um, is that I would like to restore asynchronicity. If people would stop syncing people's time with internet's time, mm. perhaps we will have a little more peace. <laughs> it's like the silence is, n we don't even let the silence begin to permeate our thinking again. Mm. Nobody does their computing standing still. I do not understand what is the really extremely urgent email you are going to sta send in that line getting into this building, which you are holding up the entire line, but you have forgotten because you're so much into your mm. phone, but you are just scrolling through shopping stuff. You can do it elsewhere. But people send emails, uh, people send important information in elevators, walking on the road, and everywhere else. If people could s do their computing standing still, preferably using a wire, because we've all know now un understood how secure Wi-Fi's are, perhaps we will have a little more sanity restored in the system. And we don't have to get instant gratification for everything. And uh, it's like, it's, it used to be that I, I think, therefore I am, but now it's like I'm tracked, therefore I am, or I tweet or Instagram, therefore I am. Otherwise, did that thing even happen? Yeah. Well. I misunderstood. <laughs> I mean, okay. And yeah, so I have a, a quick one. Um, a Point for the lady. Wrap up soon, so let's yeah, <laughs> well, I'm not anti regulation because I just checked now my Twitter account and it's flooded, you know, with me anti regulation. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, that's not what I said. <laughs> so just to make that clear. May I just add, I think we should be reminded to get this because in countries like yours and mine, where there are huge populations of young people, uh, use instant gratification is what they're looking for. So the latest technologies are being used to communicate uh, either very important messages or very, very unimportant messages all the time. And this is going to continue. We are not going to be able to stop it. We might want sanity and peace. They do not. I, 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 Jahan, I totally agree about the fact you are observing, but I am more optimistic. I think it's more, it's very fascinating. If you've not grown up on fixed line, and you're a young yep. person or an old person, and this is your first computer, it is very fascinating. Yeah. It is really very attractive. When I look at this thing and there's video on demand, there are pictures on demand, I can reach anybody, it's very fascinating. But time, over two, three years, when I actually begin to wrap my head around what this means and what it does, and if there is enough education about 
the impact of this on us as human race is dogged more and more. I, I do think that people will understand. It's the same thing, privacy is dead. Privacy is only for Mark Zuckerberg. But today, privacy is for all of us. At least we want it, we demand it, even if we are not given, but we still demand it. So I think this, if the conversation started to say and discuss a little bit more, I know my idea is unpopular, and yeah. that's no, why no, you're no, right. No, no, it's not unpopular. I'm just saying it may be r unrealistic in the short term. Short it term, may yes. happen in the long Let's term. Let's play the long game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, I, this has been a great panel. I really apologize that we've only had one hour to, to talk about these issues. Um, I think it's good that we've some ended on some positive notes from Mishi, who, who's much more optimistic. And I think we also heard some optimism. And so did John. <laughs> Um, also, uh, from Martha, too, though, the way that um, the Internet is enabling her feminist group to, to organize and mobilize. So, you know, we're, we're not here to just say that uh, the Internet is bad and evil and a threat. It's about <laughs> we need to, to marshal different social actors together to make sure that it remains a positive place for everyone. And uh, I want to plug something that kind of piggybacking on Hanan's work on the Internet Rights uh, and Principles Coalition that our institutions, the National Democratic Institute, the Center for International Media Assistance, and Center for International Private Enterprise are working on, which is uh, a, a, a principles framework for democratic processes. Um, and we're kind of talking about these very issues and what these would look like in practice for people so that we can take that to civil society activists, to some governments that you know just need a little bit of education. Um, and so you can check that out at openinternet.global. Um, we'd love you to, 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 to check that out, look at the principles that we have, the, the frameworks that we've created through uh, a crowdsourcing effort with many of the, the people on this panel, um, and to join this community. And we hope that, and I agree with you, I think that this, this type of conversation is going to be one that's going to continue going forward and become even more important. Um, so we want you to join our community and become a part of the discussion. That's openinternet.global. Um, so great. Thank you very much. A round of applause for our panelists. They were excellent. Thanks, transcriber. Thank you.